Meditating on the breath is something simple, but it can be hard to do. It's simple because it's right here. You don't have to borrow someone else's breath. You don't have to go down and buy it at the store. It's nothing far away or abstract. It's simply the sensation of the energy in the body as it brings the air into the lungs and then expels it. It's right here. What's hard about it is sticking with it, the quality of persistence. Because looking at your breath every once in a while is not going to make much difference in the mind. It makes a difference only if you really stick with it over time, again and again and again. That can sound like drudgery. And the important skill in the meditation is how to make it not drudgery, to make it interesting, something you enjoy doing. Or even when you don't enjoy it, something you find the inner strength to stick with it. And this requires discipline. The word discipline in English has a lot of unfortunate associations. We think of stern disciplinarians, the people who beat children. Those are harsh disciplinarians. They're not necessarily effective. Effective ones are the ones who discipline you, say the teachers who discipline you, and you hardly even notice you're being disciplined. who get you to behave by capturing your interest. That's when you're in school. They're the ones who make you want to learn or feel inspired by a subject. They're the ones who can reason with you, who get you on their side. And as a meditator, you need these same skills. The Buddha's teaching comes in a lot of lists. And it's inter interesting to look at the role that persistence has in almost all of them. But it's also important to realize that persistence is not just brute effort. It's an effort to be skillful, to figure out what works in the mind and helping to alleviate its alleviate its burdens, alleviate its suffering. So right effort requires not only effort, but also understanding. This is why it's interesting to see what precedes persistence in a lot of these lists, because the lists many times are meant to be sequential. You develop a certain quality, and then it makes it easier for you to be persistent. In one of the lists, the quality that precedes persistence is desire. You want the results. And don't be ashamed of that desire. It's important to have the desire to get the mind to be peaceful, to get the mind to understand itself. If you didn't have that desire, you wouldn't be here. You'd be off looking for happiness someplace else. So sometimes it's useful to remind yourself why you're meditating, what you want out of the meditation. And the desire can come from seeing the positive benefits that come from meditation, and also thinking about the negative consequences of not meditating, not getting the mind under control. We see it all around us. People give in to their anger, give in to their greed, give in to their fears, and end up doing things that they regret for the rest of their lives. The 
was simply because they didn't have any control over their minds. They knew many times what, what they were about to do was going to have bad consequences, but they went for the quick fix. Or they couldn't imagine themselves not giving in to those impulses. And then there's the whole issue of aging, illness, and death. Even if you live your life, life wisely in a sort of a normal, everyday way, don't get into trouble. Still, there's trouble waiting for you. The body grows old and it doesn't ask permission. They get sick. Again, without asking permission. And then when it dies, it takes everything. And most people are not prepared for this. This is one of the things that meditation is really good for. It gets you prepared. Because you learn how to invest your happiness in something that doesn't age, grow ill, or die. It's like learning how to invest your money in a place that's not going to be subject to wars or fires or floods, earthquakes, whatever. So one way to encourage yourself to be persistent in meditation is to think about the positive results that come, a genuine happiness, something that goes really deep down inside. Sometimes it's good to read the texts on this. The people who struggled with their practice and then finally gained awakening. And they talk about how even though the struggle may have been difficult, it was more than worth it when the results came. So it's good to keep that desire alive. In another list, desire is preceded by an understanding of what's skillful and unskillful. And otherwise, you realize you can't just sit around and hope for things to happen and then they will magically happen. This is not Barney the Dinosaur's world. If you want good results, you have to make sure that the causes are good as well. This is what keeps desire from becoming, getting in the way of the meditation. You realize you want good results, you have to focus your energy, you have to focus your attention on getting the causes right. Right now the causes are being mindful of the breath, being alert to the breath. Being ardent as you stick with the breath. Those are the issues you focus on. Sometimes it seems paradoxical. We're looking for really big results here, the deathless, the unconditioned, nirvana. And where are we told to look? Well, look at your breath. And just keep looking at your breath. But as John Lee says in one of his Dharma talks, great things start out from little things. Trees come from little seeds. People come from little tiny, tiny embryos. And it's your sensitivity to the breath that's going to develop the discernment that helps you see even more subtle things inside. We are focusing on the breath not to get the breath, but because being with the breath trains a lot of really good qualities in the mind. The mindfulness, the alertness, the sensitivity. The persistence. At the same time, as you, be, as you really pay attention to the breath, you begin to notice that certain ways of breathing are helpful for concentration and others are not. This makes it easier to stick with the breath as you begin to see there's more than just sticking with it, coming in, going out, coming in, going out. There are variations in the breath. There are subtle changes in the breath can have an impact on the body and an impact on the mind. There's a lot to explore in the breathing. Because there's not just the in and out breath, there's also the sense of energy that flows along the nerves throughout the whole body. Can you sense that? 
There's a sense of energy that flows through the blood vessels. Can you sense that? Do you see how they're related to the way you breathe in and out? There's also a very still level of energy in the body. You focus on certain spots in the body where everything just stays still no matter whether breath is coming in, breath is going out. There's a sense of stillness there. Can you locate those spots in the body? And when you've, Once you've located, can you think of that stillness spreading to fill the whole body so you're tuned into that level of energy? It's like there are many levels of energy that you can, if you're really skilled, you can tune into them at choice. So it's a lot more to see here than just in and out, in and out, in and out, when the hell is this going to end? There's lots to explore. There's lots to understand. If you're the sort of person who likes puzzles, enjoys figuring things out, there's a lot to figure out here. How you relate to the sense of the body as you feel it from inside. And if you look at the breath as something to explore in this way, you find it a lot easier to stick with it, because there's always something new to learn. Another quality that help precedes persistence in some of the lists is conviction. Conviction that all of this is worth it. That it's really will work. In the beginning of the practice you find that it's simply because this makes sense, that training the mind is going to help in other areas of your life. Or that what you do really does have an impact on the happiness or unhappiness you experience. You may have seen this principle at work in some parts of your life, but it's one of those things you can't really know for sure until you've really explored it. So in the beginning you have to take it on faith, that we're not living in a totally deterministic world or a totally random world, that by developing a skill it really is worth the effort to try to develop a skill, particularly in the area of the mind. There's enough orderliness to the world that the skills you learn today are going to help tomorrow. Yet at the same time, things are not so deterministic in an ironclad way that you can't make any difference. You can make a difference by the choices you make. And the lessons you learn by making choices today will help you make good choices tomorrow, better choices tomorrow. Well, that's something you take on conviction, and that can help fire you in the practice as well. So it's good to keep in mind these qualities, the ability to remind yourself of why you want to meditate, conviction that it really will make a difference, and an understanding that you're working on cause and effect here. You're not simply sitting here waiting for a spiritual accident to happen, where awakening will come up and whack you across the head. The discernment, the understanding that lead to awakening are things that you develop through your discernment and understanding of little things that are happening right here, right now. This principle applies not only to the meditation, but to your daily life. This is why right, this is why right action, right speech are part of the path. Be careful about what you do. Be careful about what you say. Notice cause and effect in your actions, because the actions themselves have an impact. Your words have an impact, and your ability to understand that impact is going to be really important all the way down the line. Finally, one quality that's not mentioned in the lists, but you notice throughout the teachings there's a part of the canon called the Vinaya, which is about the monastic discipline. And this is what we're working on here, is disciplining ourselves. And each of the rules has a story. The story is there to help you understand the rule. In other words, you don't obey the rule simply because the Buddha said so, or somebody else said so. There's a reason for each rule, and it helps to understand the reason. 
But it's also interesting to notice that a lot of the stories are really humorous, kind of a wry, quiet kind of humor. I think that's for a purpose. If there was nothing but harsh rules and heavy rules, people would rebel. But it's being able to look at people's misdeeds with humor gets you on the side of the rule. You see through their hypocrisy. You see through their denial of what they're doing. And it's presented in a way that it's funny. And your ability to laugh at them helps get you on the side of the rule. The way this translates into the practice is that you have to have a good sense of humor about what you're doing. When things don't go well, don't get really frustrated. Learn how to laugh at yourself and move on. Because what does a laugh do? It helps you to distance you from small, narrow ways of thinking. You step back a bit. You step out of that particular personality, that particular identity that's so wound up and tight in a particular issue. You step back from it a bit, get a larger perspective. That larger perspective is part of wisdom. So these are some of the qualities that help with persistence, help with discipline. There's the desire for the results. The conviction that what you do does make a difference, and that a genuine happiness really is possible. Finally, an understanding of cause and effect, which comes together with that sense of humor. We tend to live very much in our own little worlds, and an important part of the meditation is learning to step back from our thought worlds and not believe them. Just stick with the sensation of the breath coming in, going out, thought worlds come up. They can tell you all kinds of things and all kinds of voices, shouting voices, whispering voices, seductive voices, harsh voices, that in normal circumstances would get you running with them. But here we're trying to step out of those worlds. And that understanding, that perspective is what makes the discipline livable, so it doesn't feel harsh, but it is effective. This is part of the wisdom of learning to be a good meditator, is learning to how to discipline yourself well. There's nobody here standing with a whip to force you to stay with the breath. Everybody's sitting here quietly with their eyes closed, and you could be thinking about anything in the world. It's up to you to discipline yourself to make sure that you really are sticking with the breath and that you're getting something out of the experience. So learn how to do it effectively, because it makes all the difference in the world.